Jack, welcome on stage. Thank you so much. Cool. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Today I'm going to talk to you a bit about bug hunting beyond Facebook.com. I'll explain what that means in a minute, but um, essentially we have a bug hunting program. I want to show you what it means um, to not just look at Facebook.com. We have a lot of other acquisitions that I want you to kind of take a look at. So my name's Jack. I've been at Facebook since April 2016, so a couple of years now. I used to do a lot of bug bounty myself. Um, I was also working as an app second consultant, so various technology companies finding bugs for them. I'm currently leading the white hat engineering effort at Facebook, so we have tooling to help us either find or triage bugs, and then for researchers to be able to send them in. And then I still try and find bugs myself, but this is internally now. Uh, not much bug bounty anymore. So before I speak about our bug bounty program, it kind of makes sense to describe uh, the scale of engineering that we have at Facebook. It's pretty key to our culture. We have uh, all of these kind of posters around the office. You may have seen them. So example, like done is better than perfect. We have one that's move fast and build things. This used to be move, move fast and break things, but we had to change it because we don't want things broken anymore. <laughs> so, one, <laughs> so one of our uh, mottos that we use at Facebook is that uh, nothing at Facebook is somebody else's problem. And what we mean by that is that we kind of want to encourage people to write new code, write new features. If they want to change something, they can. Um, that culture is great. Uh, it means we can create a lot of new products easily. Uh, if you want to change something, you can. But that obviously uh, can come with um, not problems, but we want to ensure that it's done securely. The scale is pretty substantial. So these are some statistics from 2015. Uh, in 2015, we had around 15,000 employees. Now we have over 30,000. So there's no public stats currently, but if this is what we had in 2015, over 600 pushes to our dub, dub, dub code base. That's quite a lot of code changed. Over a million source control commands each day were run at Facebook in 2015, uh, and over 100,000 commits across all of our repositories. This is pretty crazy. Um, we need a team to deal with this kind of code at this scale. So we have the product security team. This is essentially our AppSec team that I work on. It's named product security for various reasons, but it's essentially application security. Our kind of motto or our team aim is that we want to protect the products and the users of the Facebook family. When we talk about Facebook, we don't just mean Facebook, the website or the apps. We mean everything that Facebook either owns or develops. So this can be Instagram, Oculus, those kind of things. So how do we do that? Uh, we do it with a few different ways. We want to give developers everything that they need to ship code securely. It's great finding bugs. You know, our team is, is very good at that. Uh, but ideally, we don't want bugs in the first place. We can do that by training, like face-to-face -face or documentation. Uh, I'm sure if you work in security, you know that things are very well documented all the time. Um, so we try, and <laughs> we try and ensure that we have good documentation as well, wherever possible. Sorry. <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face. Um, <laughs> and we also develop a lot of tools for engineers. We have some great static code analysis tools that we've developed internally. I'll touch on that in a bit. We also have a team that writes secure frameworks and APIs. Um, if you want to, for example, run an SQL query, we don't want you to do create raw queries and run them. We want to make a framework that's easy for you to use. Um, we'll make it secure, but we need to incentivize developers to use it. So not only is it secure, but we need to make it like, um, interesting. So whether that's like more performant than the other code or just nice to use. There's also general guidance, assistance, and awareness. So we have an on-call rotation. So if anyone has any questions about product security, they can come speak to us. We have a month of um, security awareness in October called Hacktober. This is where we do like a CTF, uh, various challenges. Uh, we have like lock picking villages, that kind of thing, to try and p make people aware of like securities in this like scary thing. It's what everyone should be involved in. The team also works on some interesting side projects. These are to try and like benefit the community and the whole internet. One of them is a certificate transparency project. Um, initially, this was developed so that we can monitor if any Facebook.com certificates were being issued that we didn't ask for. This monitors the various feeds that CAs publish. But we also uh, made it publicly accessible. So if you want to monitor your own domains, you can do that now on the developer site. And then this is one of my favorite projects that people have worked on. 
we have what's called invariant detector. This monitors every single write that happens on Facebook, which as you can imagine is pretty, there's quite a lot of them. It basically learns invariant. So a good example is in a group, if a profile picture is deleted, it's always done by the admin. The, um, this is learn. If it ever sees that this is done by a normal group member, it will block the write, even though we didn't know that there was a secu <clears throat> security issue. It will then flag it for the team. We can investigate and triage and find um, and kill the bug, essentially. So this is pretty awesome, but these are the side projects. The team in London specifically focuses on three main areas. The first is security reviews. This is what most people are probably familiar with. We work with teams across Facebook, Instagram, and so on to do design and architecture reviews. If they've got a new feature or product and they want to understand how to develop it securely. We also do code reviews, kind of like traditional find bugs, work with the team to fix them, uh, that kind of thing. Another area is program analysis. I mentioned earlier about static code analysis. We have a tool internally called Zonkalan. I believe that name is public. I was look, looking at my manager, but he's not paying attention. So I, is, is Zonkalan public now? Well it, well, it is now, actually, because yeah, this is on Facebook Live. Um, <laughs> no, it's public. Yeah, you can't say no. Um, so we have a pretty cool static code analysis system uh, designed and built internally for our hack code base, which is, I guess, a fork of PHP. It's super customized to our code base, so it can find traditional bugs like cross-site scripting and SQL injection, but we have rules written specifically for our business logic. So uh, if we want to check that a developer isn't calling one of our dangerous functions that could bypass privacy checks, then uh, this will pick it up. It will flag it either in our, one of our internal tools or it will show as a limp warning in, like built into their IDE or when they submit their code. It's pretty great. Um, there was a presentation done about it by one of the engineers. Uh, I can't remember which conference, but if you search for it, you'll find it. And then the topic of this talk, uh, the white hat program. So this is what I'm most passionate about. This my background is bug bounty. Um, so now that I've given you an overview of the team and what we work on, I can talk to you a bit about the program, the, the bug bounty program. So we need the bug bounty program. It's one of our like, last layers of defense. Uh, we have various things such as the reviews, tooling, but at the end of the day, you can still ship code that's got bugs in it. So we rely on researchers around the world to kind of pick up on some of this stuff, inform us, and they uh, get paid for it. These are some of the numbers. They're slightly out of date, uh, so just add a few digits to them. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> maybe not this one. But we have a $500 minimum bounty. This is pretty great. Uh, if you find a valid bug and it has significant security or privacy impact, we'll pay $500 for it. We don't have a maximum bounty. There is a maximum amount we've paid Pub, pub, public? I'm, I'm <laughs> this is currently the largest public amount that we've paid, which is $40,000. Um, this is for a code execution issue in Facebook. This was last year, I believe. Um, if anyone remembers Image Tragic, uh, this is all public. Um, we were vulnerable to it, and we paid $40,000 for that. So that's a very painful um, lesson on patching. Anyway, <laughs> paid out over 5 million since 2011. This is around, I think, six and a half now. Um, by the end of this year, hopefully, we'll reach the $7 million mark. Over 900 researchers in 100 countries have been paid. This is pretty cool. So we get a lot of researchers from Western Europe, uh, India, and Pakistan. But we also have researchers from a lot of smaller countries like Croatia and Trinidad. Uh, two of our top researchers are from Croatia and Trinidad. So that's pretty fun working with them. Over 12,000 submissions last year. Out of those, over 500 were valid. So signal to noise is not... Um, it's something we're working on, is the way that I would phrase it. Um, we've got some interesting projects that we're working on this year, uh, none of which are public, so I can't talk about them, but that we're using to boost that uh, percentage. It's pretty self-explanatory the way it works. The researchers find a bug, they send it in to us. We investigate and triage it. If it's valid, uh, we'll work with the team to give them all the details they need, uh, suggest ways that they can fix it and review the fix and work with them, and then we'll reward the researcher minimum of $500. We also work with the teams to ensure that uh, they can apply like additional features to it so they don't introduce bugs in the future. So there may be, say, one cross-site scripting bug, but we'll work with them to like change the way that they that their code or their libraries work so that they can never introduce a cross-site scripting bug again. Or we'll add logging to make it easier to catch these things in the future. The London team specifically, which is one I work on, focuses on the engineering and tooling. Um, we also have on-call rotations once every few months. So we're on call 24-7 in case there's a serious bug. 
so far I've not been waking up woken up in the night, but now that I've said that, I probably will next time I'm on call. <laughs> um, so we triage bugs. Uh, we work with the incident response and cert teams uh, if necessary, and then work closely with the teams on fixing. The thing to bear in mind with Facebook is that we have pretty unique bug types in our bug bunny program. Um, for instance, Facebook is you know, a huge code base, but we only received two cross-site scripting bugs last year in Facebook. Um, we've essentially eliminated SQL injection. I can't remember the last time we, I, I don't even know if we've received one in our bug bunny program ever. So instead we have like business logic issues. The privacy model of Facebook is um, complicated. So there can be edge cases that researchers like to find. And we're also very um, welcoming of those findings. The scope comprises of a lot more than just Facebook.com. So it's Facebook and Messenger, which you're probably aware of, but we also have like older acquisitions like Instagram, Oculus and WhatsApp, and then smaller things like our open source projects like OS Query. Uh, we also have hardware now, such as Oculus's own hardware. But today I'm gonna cover some bugs in Oculus and Instagram, since this is all about not Facebook.com. So with Oculus, um, this was added to our scope in 2014. So it's one of the older acquisitions that we have. Um, very wide scope, similar to Facebook, start at oculus.com. Um, any subdomain you find a bug on it, tell us and we'll fix it and hopefully pay you. We have Oculus Rift and other hardware. So if you're interested in native code or hardware hacking, um, we'll pay you if you find bugs in it. We receive mainly web bugs in our program and some mobile bugs, but we're very interested in hearing from people who have background in native security and hardware. So please come find me or one of the other Facebook team afterwards if you're interested in doing bug bounty in that area and we'll give you some tips. And we also have desktop apps as well. So this has a different kind of style of vulnerabilities compared to our web apps. So some of the write-ups from when, the, when Oculus was added into scope. Um, it's one of my all-time favorite bugs that someone ever found. They found a CSRF bug, pretty high impact but they managed to escalate it to code execution. So you would click a link, and then you would run code on Oculus's server. That's unexpected and not ideal. <laughs> it's, it's an understatement, probably. Um, the guy who wrote this up, it's on his blog, his name's Bitquark. He won't appreciate it if I say his real name, so I'll just say his, his alias, but <clears throat> search for his blog afterwards, it's a great read. We also have an SDK and an API for developers. Um, this also has its own challenges. So when we write code at Facebook, we want the code to be secure, especially if it's deployed on our systems. But if we um, distribute that code for other, other people, we don't want to be the cause of a cross-site scripting bug on a million websites, right? So we need to ensure that the SDK is safe. Codebase is mainly PHP and hack. Um, similar to Facebook, a lot of it is ported onto our infrastructure now. So that's a very brief overview of how Oculus works in our bug bounty system, uh, bug bounty program even. So now I will show you one of the cool bugs that we received. Um, if you were involved in bug bunnies around 2013, 2014, um, you may have heard a lot about OAuth. So, <laughs> so OAuth, which is a system of letting you log into other websites with uh, another website. So Facebook is an OAuth provider. You can sign up as an OAuth uh, consumer and allow people to log into your website via Facebook. We had a string of bugs in 2013. This researcher, Igor Homokov, is pretty famous for finding these style of bugs. Him and um, another researcher who now works on the Seattle team, Andre, found a way of basically stealing your access token and logging into your account. Very bad, we fixed it. Uh, that was that in 2013. Another famous researcher did it, and he also did it again, which is why the, he named it How I Hacked Any Facebook Account Again. This was a pretty bad um, string of issues that we had. Uh, this happened, I can probably think of like maybe five or 10 public blog posts about how to steal access tokens around 2013 using OAuth. So we essentially solved that problem at Facebook. We haven't really had any of those bugs for a few years now. We're pretty strict with how OAuth works, uh, using state parameters to prevent CSRF, those, those kind of bugs. So that was solved, all done. And then we started using OAuth for Oculus. So this is the screen that you would see if you go to Oculus and you wanna log in. We wanted to allow you to log in with Facebook on Oculus. Makes it very easy, you don't have to manually enter your email address, you click this and you sign up. It uses our Facebook OAuth flow, but because Oculus is part of Facebook, we did a few custom things to make it easier. Um, didn't make it easier, so I will show you what happened. <laughs> this is the standard flow that happens when you log in. You hit author.oculus.com with a login uh, URL you set the redirect URI to wherever you want to go afterwards. In this case, www.oculus.com. 
This balances you to Facebook's normal OAuth flow, but it has a special non-parameter. This is a secret value uh, that we use uh, for Oculus and I think Instagram as well. That it should, in theory, be unguessable. Prevents anyone else trying to force you to force you to log in, force them to log in. Yeah, to steal their token, basically. <laughs> this generates a signed URI. Uh, we have a timestamp prevent replay attacks. The hash is bound to the user session in addition to the URL parameters. So this can't be replayed against another user. It will not work if they don't have the same session as you. After this, you'll then redirect it back to Oculus. In the fragment is the access token. You're logged in, done. Like four steps, pretty easy. It's transparent, you click a link and eventually you're logged in. You then see the screen, this is your account. And before someone tries to submit this as a bug, this is a fake email address, fake test account. This is not information disclosure right now. Please, please don't send this in to me afterwards. <laughs> and the account's delete, deleted now as well. So um, as I mentioned, clicking the link goes to Facebook's OAuth flow. The nonce is bound to your IP address. Um, IPs can be shared across users, I understand that, but like it's more like defense in depth approach. If you're familiar with the way that OAuth bugs work, the, the aim is that we want to leak this token to a third party website. With, um, in a browser, if you have a fragment, so the URL fragment, which is the hash and anything afterwards, these are carried across an HTTP 301 and 302 redirect. This never reaches the server. The browser just essentially carries it along unless you explicitly unset it or override it. So our aim is that we want to steal this fragment. We want to get it to a third party site because as soon as it's there, they can read it and take over the account. With OAuth, there's also the concept of code. Uh, we don't need to worry too much about that. This should never be, even if you steal it, it shouldn't be vulnerable if you're checking the redirect URI. And we're rewarding for like a full uh, exploit chain here. We care about open redirects, but they're usually re rewarded with like $500. But if you can chain them into an account takeover, it's probably more like 10 or uh, 15,000. So we care about this nonce, either bypassing the nonce or leaking the nonce. So I'm gonna show you the attack flow that someone sent in. Just bear with me because there's like eight steps and it might get confusing, but it's pretty interesting. So first bug that he found was login CSRF. This would force you to log into the attacker's account on Oculus. Again, like login CSRF, pretty minor issue that we may or may not reward, but in a chain, it's worth a lot more. Once you're logged into the attacker's account, this bypasses some of the checks because you already have a session. You'll then manually browse to the OAuth page. So the attacker would give you this link or load it in a hidden iframe or a pop-up. The parameters were set to response type token and from login equals one. We want the token because we can steal that. From login equals one, essentially kind of like bypass one of the checks. This then generates the nonce for you, so the attacker didn't need to know about this. And then this redirects you straight back to Oculus. So this is the first half of the attack. Uh, the researcher was able to go from Oculus back to, through Facebook, back to Oculus with an access token. So now that we're on Oculus, we want to leak this token to a third party website. You can see in the URL, there's a redirect URI parameter. We've set this to facebook.com slash business. One of the ways that we handle redirects at Facebook is, or Oculus and other systems, we restrict where they can go. Otherwise, we have open redirects. The way that we do that is that we want to you know, like ensure that it's an oculus.com domain, or we may expand that slightly and say it needs to be an oculus or a facebook.com or one of our like family URLs. In this case, the researcher found that facebook.com.business was allowed. So on facebook.com slash business, there was also an open redirect. This wasn't quite an open redirect. It was a FB only redirect. So this had a set of allowed URIs. In this case, star.fb was allowed. So what did he do there? Found another open redirect. Insights.fb.com is hosted on WordPress VIP. So we use this for some of our marketing sites. It allows us to sandbox it off of our infrastructure. Um, it's constantly updated. It's managed by WordPress. WordPress VIP has a pretty cool feature. Remote login.php, the back parameter, if you set that to a another hosted WordPress instance, like wp.attacker.com, it will redirect to it. I think in this case, the if the C name is registered, but the blog wasn't active or vice versa, then it would do the redirect. But in this case, another kind of semi-open redirect only goes to WordPress, but chained with that, you would then end up the attacker's website and the fragment, since it's been carried all the way across, the attacker can extract that and then take over the account. So these seven steps allow the researcher to make this cool exploit chain like chain together four semi-open, three semi-open redirects, a login CSRF that we don't particularly care about into something worth considerably more. 
I want to show you the proof of concept link that he sent in. So send in all these, you know, steps that are very good to reproduce it, but it's always handy when you have like one link. So this was the link. Um, yes, there you go. So <laughs> this has like five levels deep of URL encoding here. Like this is how many redirects there were. He needed to encode the slash like five times. Like this is crazy, but you would click this after like seven redirects, end up with the attackers website and they take over the account. So we were very, very happy to hear about this, managed to patch everything. We re rewarded the researcher $10,000. So like this was a pretty awesome bug. If he'd reported the four issues independently, maybe $500 each, but when chained together, he could demonstrate that it's much higher impact. So $10,000, pretty good. We actually paid this twice to the researcher. Um, it's possible to have regressions quite easily, and it's also possible to not necessarily, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can have regressions, and uh, luckily, researchers can catch them, and they can tell us, and then we reward them twice. So we're pretty nice like that. If people tell us about the bug again, we'll pay them another $10,000. Uh, luckily, this was only twice and not three times. <laughs> so what, one, of the, one of the good tips if you do bug bounty is we try to write test cases for our fixes. You should also write test cases for your fixes, because if you run them and we make a regression, then you can catch that very easily and tell us to make another $10,000. So that's my first half. That's Oculus. I want to touch on a pretty cool Instagram bug, like a class of bug that we're kind of seeing right now. Um, so Instagram, I'm sure everyone knows what Instagram is, but this was added way back in 2012. So this has been in Scope for as long as we've had a bug bounty program. Again, Scope is pretty wide. Start at Instagram. We have two APIs. The public API, which is a read-only API that developers use. Uh, we have the private APIs that the, uh, <clears throat> the mobile apps use. There's also GraphQL, if you're familiar with testing Facebook GraphQL. It applies to um, Instagram as well. We also have mobile apps. If you're good at testing Android or iOS, it's a good place to look. The stack for Instagram is mainly Python and Django. There are some thrift uh, services written in Hack for like backend things, but predominantly Python. One of the classes of bugs that we've essentially eliminated at Facebook is CSRF. So I realized that this screenshot says cross-site froggery. This is not my screenshot. It should say forgery. I'm sure you get the idea. These are a couple of write-ups that people have done in the past about Facebook bugs, Facebook CSRF bugs. You may recognize the name in the first one. If you do, good. If you don't, then don't worry about it. But these are some interesting bugs that people have found, CSRF bugs on Facebook. Um, <laughs> So the way that traditional CSRF works, uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but I'll kind of go over it. The aim is that we want to perform an action as another user. This basically exploits the fact that browsers um, implicitly send cookies with, I put every, I'm going to say most now. Uh, we also have same site cookies coming, but essentially you know, we want to trick the server into thinking that the user performed the action. The way that we solved it at Facebook, um, we use a random token that the server generates, sends back to the client, we compare it, uh, when the request is in, and we can verify the user did it. We actually, never mind, I'm not going to, I don't know if that's public, so I will skip this slide. Basically, we've solved it at Facebook. Um, at Instagram is similar. Uh, we use Django middleware, so CSRF view middleware. Injects a CSRF token into the form. Um, this runs against every post, put, and delete, so a state changing request. And you can also enable it against, like, um, arbitrary views as well if you want, and then a 403 is returned. So this must be sufficient, right? Everything is solved now, no more CSRF ever again. Yeah, definitely solved? Not quite. So this is a class of bugs that we've seen a, a few times, well, I'm not going to say a lot, a few times at Facebook for in and Instagram as well. Um, we've coined a client side CRF. CSRF, we have no idea what it's actually called. If someone has a better name for this, then please let me know and we'll change our blog post. But essentially, we want to influence a CSRF protected request to point somewhere else. So imagine that every endpoint now is protected against CSRF. No way of uh, bypassing this token. But imagine that the request that is being made with, a, with this token, you could point somewhere else. You've essentially got CSRF again, but it's still protected. So a very naive example is that if you do a post request to a user provided URL with the token, then that's vulnerable because you could just point it somewhere else. Good example that we have, like in Facebook world, if, you, if you're going to post a message on a group and you've got an ID parameter, but if you change that to delete account, it will still do the post request with the correct token, except that it will delete the user's account. This can be present in JavaScript, so you may be getting a value out of the fragment or the request. It could also be present server side. Please don't ever write this code, but if you did write this code, then this could be potentially vulnerable. 
Um, we have rules at Facebook to make sure people don't write this code. Um, so Instagram had this bug. We have a subdomain called business.instagram.com. This is used for running ads on Instagram. A researcher found that this um, uses the Graph API. The Graph API is our API for Facebook and Instagram that lets you make requests. Uh, we use it internally, and uh, third parties can use it as well. This is implicitly protected against CSRF. Like it uses a access token rather than cookies for authentication. So each time you make the request, you need to give that token. So it's not possible to do a traditional kind of CSRF uh, attack against it. So no cookies means you have a token each time. So the standard flow that this uh, Instagram website used was it would take the ID from the URL. So slash business slash one, two, three, four, five. Then makes a graph API call on page load to one, two, three, four, five. So what happens if we don't um, give one, two, three, four, five? Well, this is what it should, sh should, should show. Welcome Jack's test business because that's my ID. However, if it's not an integer and you give an ID of GraphQL percent 3FQ percent 3D mutation dot 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 dot, it will then suddenly URL decode it and then do a post request to our Graph API with a mutation um, which is not expected behavior. We add this special parameter ABC just to make sure that the URI doesn't get screwed. But the GraphQL request is made in the context of the user. This means you could potentially make a post to them, you could change uh, email address, anything that a user can do through the graph, uh, graph API, you can now do. And it's still protected against CSRF because we're using this access token, except that you've just pointed it somewhere else. So yep, we see it as a valid request. So if you were to click this special URL encoded link, what would you see? Suddenly a post has been made to your timeline, even though you just clicked a valid link and it hit a CSRF protected endpoint. So I've blanked out the researcher's name here because it wasn't public at the time. This is from a researcher called Philippe. Uh, he's from Trinidad. He's one of our top researchers. He found this and sent it into us. Uh, we were pretty happy. Uh, we were able to reward him $7,500 for this. This is a pretty crazy bug. We would now potentially reward 10 to 15,000 if this was on Facebook. There were some caveats because it was business or Instagram.com, but these are pretty impactful bugs. CSRF allows you on Facebook to again, essentially do a count takeover. If you can CSRF someone into changing their email to yours, issue a password reset, and then you have access to the account. We actually did a write-up of this. Uh, if you go to facebook.com slash bug bunny, you'll see that we did a blog post explaining some of these issues, how to find them, uh, and some tips for testing. These are, can be especially difficult to pick up with static code analysis. If the issue is present in JavaScript, then like we don't, it's not easy to find, let's say. But as a bug bunny person, you have access to all the JavaScript. You can essentially do white box testing. You can get all the JavaScript that we have, see if you can find issues where we're passing in user provided values into a XHR request or a form post, then see if it's vulnerable and send it in to us. And then this is the slide that my manager made me put in. <laughs> we are, of course, hiring London. Um, we have like uh, both engineer roles and analyst level roles for Y Hat and for Prodsec. Uh, and then, of course, the other offices that you definitely don't want to work in because the London office is a lot better. Um, so thanks so much for your time. Like I realized I went through that pretty, pretty quickly, but hopefully you have like an idea of like some bugs, that, cool bugs that we get outside of Facebook, some tips for testing, and a bit of an overview about our team. Any questions? No Anyone? questions? <laughs> Anything you want to ask me at all about Facebook that I can say publicly? <laughs> well, I guess we'll probably have to take questions uh, during the break. So thanks mm. very much, Jack. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.